In this video, I'm going to talk about dislocation geometry. And what I mean by that is the relationship between the things that describe the dislocation. So the Berger's vector, the dislocation line, and the slip plane. It will be useful if you have some background knowledge about dislocations and their structure before you watch this video. So as we think about a dislocation's structure, we're going to think about three different features. One of those is the Berger's vector. The Berger's vector represents the closure failure when you do a Berger circuit and tells us something about the direction and the magnitude by which the atoms are displaced due to the dislocation. The second one is the dislocation line. So dislocation is a linear defect and there is a line that sort of separates the um, displaced material from the not displaced material. And so that's what the dislocation line represents. And then the third thing is the slip plane, which can be described by the slip plane normal. The slip plane or the glide plane is the plane that the dislocation moves in. And we'll talk more about that later in this video. We'll then go on to talk about the relationship between these three descriptors of the dislocation structure and see how we can figure out characteristics of the dislocation on the basis of these things. So how do we describe a dislocation's structure? Let's start with the Berger's vector. So in this dislocation up here, we have an edge dislocation, and down here we have a screw dislocation. And for both of these, we can see what the Berger's vector is and what the dislocation line is. So the Berger's vector is already highlighted on here. And again, it's that closure failure from doing the Berger circuit. And I'm not going to get into in this video how we do it, but there's where the Berger's vector is. It's pointing one unit to the right. And then we can see that the dislocation line is marked out here. So this is moving into uh, this block, right? It um, aligns, let's say, like on this direction, but down here in the middle. So it's pointing in and out of the page, and our Berger's vector here is pointing to the right. In the screw dislocation, the Berger's vector is right here, so it's also in this direction, sort of front to back, and the dislocation line is as well. So in this one, the dislocation line is sort of along this center point where the left side has been shifted relative to the right side. So we've got the Berger's vector and the dislocation line for these two different structures. An important thing to note is the relationship between B and T. And again, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but it's the case that for an edge dislocation that these things are perpendicular to one another. So the Berger's vector is perpendicular to the dislocation line. And in a screw dislocation, we see that the Berger's vector is parallel to the dislocation line. So just because these are shown at different points here, these directions in the crystallographic sense are still parallel to one another. So conceptually, we want to know what is the slip plane or what is the glide plane? So as a reminder, and again, this is covered more elsewhere, a dislocation moves by, and this is for an edge dislocation, but it moves by kind of moving one step at a time, and that is dislocation glide, and so, or dislocation slip, we can call it either one. But this is happening in the slip plane, and it is the plane that contains both the Berger's vector and the dislocation line. Now, if you remember what we were just looking at, and even in these pictures you can see, so the dislocation line here is pointing into the page, and the Berger's vector would be pointing to the left or right. So there's not a particular plane maybe that you can imagine in your own head <laughs> that contains those, but in the crystallographic sense, the slip plane is the plane that contains both the Berger's vector as a crystallographic direction and the dislocation line as a crystallographic direction. So in this case, it's this horizontal plane here because that contains both the dislocation line that runs into the page and the Berger's vector that runs to the side. So let's look at some other examples here. 
All right, so this is an example of an edge dislocation, the same one we were looking at before. And in this case, our slip plane is somewhere like this, right? So it's kind of like that. And so that contains both the dislocation line and the burgers vector. And so this is the plane here that the dislocation can move in because it contains, again, in a crystallographic sense, both the burgers vector and the dislocation line. For an edge dislocation, because B is perpendicular to T, there will be one unique slip plane. So there's one plane that contains those two things. So it's straightforward with an edge dislocation to figure out what is the slip plane. And we'll do an example of that later. Now let's look for a screw dislocation. So for a screw dislocation, remember B and T were parallel. And so that means that there's actually an infinite number of planes that could be the slip plane for this material. Now, in a crystallographic sense, it's going to be a close-packed plane. So it's not just going to be, uh, you know, any old plane of any orientation. So in this example, we have this initial state. So we have B and T sort of in this orientation that I'm showing here. So one possible case is that the dislocation moves on a slip plane that's sort of of this orientation, right? And you can see here that the dislocation is moving um, to the left and it's moving in this plane because the extra sort of this offset bit is moving over in each part of the picture, okay? Now, the second option is shown down here. And now in this case, the uh, offset part, it was here and now it's actually moving down and now it's moving down further. So it's moving now in this vertical plane is where this is moving, okay? So for a screw dislocation, there's not just one unique plane, but there could be more than one. However, it's still the case that it moves in a plane that contains B and T. So that part is consistent no matter what. Okay, so how do we know what kind of dislocation it is? If it's an edge dislocation or a screw dislocation, if we're just given, let's say, B and T, right? If we look at these pictures that we've seen in the textbooks all the time, then it's relatively easy to say that's an edge dislocation or a screw dislocation. But what if we only know the characteristics of the dislocation in terms of B and T? So let's talk about how we would do that. All right, so we wanna figure out what kind of dislocation it is. Now, we've already established that for an edge dislocation, we know that the Burgers vector is perpendicular to the dislocation line. And for a screw dislocation, the Burgers vector is parallel to the dislocation line. And then you also can have a mixed dislocation, in which case the Burgers vector makes some kind of an angle with the dislocation line. So those are our three kinds. So let's consider an example. And let's say that um, we have a BCC material, okay? And in a BCC material, the Burgers vector is the close packed direction. And so that is a one, one, one type of direction. So we'll just say that that's what the Burgers vector is. And then let's uh, just say, so this is what you would be given, that the dislocation line is the two bar one, one, direction. All right, and I want to know what kind of dislocation is this? Well, you know, we have this information over here about B and T. And so all we have to do is actually find the angle in between B and T, and then we can answer that question. All right, so we know how to find the angle between two vectors, or we should know how to find the angle between two vectors. And so we do that with the equation cosine of theta is equal to B dot t divided by the magnitude of b and the magnitude of t. All right, so we can just plug that in. So we have the cosine of theta is equal to um, 1, 1, 1 dotted with 2 bar 1, 1 and then divided by the magnitude of these. So the magnitude of 
one, one, one. Uh, that would be the square root of three. And the magnitude of this one would be the square root of six. And we do the dot product on the top and we have negative two plus one plus one, which actually gives us zero. So the cosine of theta is equal to zero. And that tells us that theta is equal to 90 degrees. And that means that this is an edge dislocation, right? Because theta was equal to 90 degrees. So um, if you're wanting to actually find the value of theta, you have to remember to do the denominator part. Now, if you're just wanting to do a quick check, are these perpendicular to one another? It's enough to simply see is the dot product equal to zero or not. All right, so let's say that instead I had had a dislocation line that was equal to one, 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 right? Well, this is easy enough to see by inspection that these things are parallel and therefore that would be a screw dislocation. All right, so we check what kind of a dislocation it is by figuring out the angle in between the two uh, vectors. And then we come back up here and we check what is the relationship on the basis of that angle. All right, so the last thing that we want to be able to do here is to figure out what is the slip plane given a value or given a Berger's vector and given a dislocation line. And then ultimately we want to just be able to move between these three, B and T and the slip plane. So let's see how to do that. So what we know about the slip plane is that the slip plane contains B and T, the Berger's vector and the dislocation line. Now, from our vector math, we know, and I'm not gonna go into to why this is the case here, but we know that we can find a vector that is perpendicular to two other vectors by doing the cross product. So if we do the cross product of B with T, that will give us a vector N which is the slip plane normal. So that's the vector that is perpendicular to both B and T. And so that is giving us the plane that they lie in. So one uh, happy coincidence here is that for cubic materials, the normal to a plane is given by the same direction. So for any plane HKL, the direction that's normal to it is the HKL. So the normal to the 100 plane is the 100 direction, for example. So even though what we're finding here is a direction that's perpendicular to both B and T, that's giving the normal to that plane that has those same indices. All right, so if we know any two of these, B, T, and N, we can actually find the other one uh, in the case of an edge dislocation. But if we know B and T, then we can always find N. So let's do an example of this using the same dislocation that we had on the previous slide. So we started with this Berger's vector and this dislocation line. We had already established that this was an edge dislocation where these two things were perpendicular to each other. And so if we want to know the normal to those, then we will just do B cross T and find the slip plane normal. So if we do that cross product math here, then we end up with a vector that is 0, 3, bar 3. And because we want to write things in the lowest integer value, then that would be 0, 1, bar 1. So that's the slip plane normal. That means that this dislocation can move in the 0, 1, bar 1 direction. And if we just want to check our math, make sure that we did this right, then n should be perpendicular to b. So we can check on the dot product of 1, 1, 1 with 0, 1 bar 1. And that is equal to 0. So good, those are perpendicular. And then we can check 2 bar 1, 1 dot product with 0, 1 bar 1. And that's also 0. So we know that we, in fact, found a direction that is perpendicular to both b and t. So that's how we find the slip plane if we just take the cross product. And now given all of these things together, you should be able to make some calculations and understand the geometry 
of a dislocation a little bit better.